Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about things that matter at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum counselor and teacher, intuitive guide, author and podcaster, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This show is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ancient wisdom validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. My intention for this podcast is to be engaging, educational, empowering, and fun, but it may also surprise or even shock you as we venture into deep rabbit holes and out on a limb as far as we can. Each conversation is different. Each guest is unique. Each episode is a story with profound wisdom you may want to listen to more than once. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. Okay, let's begin. and welcome back to Quantum Living. Before I introduce today's topic and my special guest, I'd like to give you the heads up that the next episode to be published on July 12th will be the final episode in Season 4. From July 26th, my podcast will move into Season 5, which will have a slightly different format with more content from my own quantum work and research as well as the guest spots. I will soon release more details in my Quantum Talk newsletter, so the best way to stay up to date is to subscribe to it either on my podcast website at quantumlivingpodcast.com or on my main business website at quantumliving.com.au. And of course, it is free. And now back to today's episode. As I say up front in my podcast description, I like going into deep rabbit holes and out on a limb as far as I can. For the listeners unfamiliar with these iconic metaphors, it means diving into the unknown, pushing the boundaries of our thinking about and understanding of life, asking questions many would not even know that they can be asked. (laughs) Today's episode is definitely in this category, a deep dive into the alchemy of life what it is and why it is important that we understand it and learn how to work with it for our benefit. And I couldn't possibly find anyone more qualified to speak to this topic than my guest, whom many of you would be well familiar with. My special guest today is Dr. Teresa bullard Weick. Dr. Teresa is a physicist, author, speaker, international teacher, Change Agent, host of Quantum Minds TV, and the host of Mystery Teachings on Gaia TV. Throughout her lifelong journey, she has discovered innovative ways to weave together her formal education as a PhD physicist with her deep training in the modern mystery school lineage and a passion for bridging science and spirituality in a practical way. She has presented to live audiences all around the world since 2002, helping thousands of people awaken to their greater potential, find deeper meaning and purpose, and achieve greater success in life, fusing modern-day quantum physics with powerful, time-tested techniques for harnessing consciousness Dr. Teresa brings a truly fresh, mind-expanding and powerfully altering approach. And now, Dr. Teresa joins me from Northern England. Hello, Dr. Teresa. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you, Anna. It's a pleasure to be joining you today. Lovely. Out of my guests working in the space I live in at the intersection of science and spirituality, you come by far closest <laughs> to my to my paradigm. So This will be a fascinating conversation, so let's dive right in. Could you please share with us a little of your personal story? 
I'm curious, did you find yourself on this pathway of bridging science and spirituality organically, if you like? Or was there a pivotal point that propelled you to change the course of your life? Mm, that's a great question. There was definitely a pivotal point uh, that I came to. And at the same time, it was um, synchronicity uh, that helped guide the process. So I had been exposed to a lot of alternative spirituality from a young age because my parents raised us with a very open mind, which was very helpful, um, but they didn't really impose any particular set of beliefs upon us. They just allowed us to make up our own minds about things. Um, as a young person, I was more drawn towards very grounded, practical uh, understanding and you know, I ultimately went into science. So as I was moving my way into university and then into graduate school, I ended up in physics. I don't think I would have chosen physics, but it what I chose actually, I've wanted to study astronomy uh, because I I can't I had this um, point in my life uh, when I was contemplating what do I want to, you know pursue as a degree in uh, my education. And I had this moment where we were driving through the desert and I looked out at the at the night sky and I thought, oh my gosh, there's so much out there. It's so beautiful when you can see the night sky without any light pollution. And I thought, I want to know what's out there. I want to know what's going on in this bigger universe beyond our mundane human dramas that we get into in this, you know, physical world here. And so that's what ultimately set me on the path to becoming a physicist. So I went in wanting to study astronomy, but the the school that I went to um, didn't really have astronomy as a major. So that then directed me into physics. And ultimately I, I shifted into really getting excited about high energy physics, particle physics, quantum physics. And when I went into graduate school, I, I went in to pursue um, a PhD in this uh, experimental field of understanding particle physics. And uh, while I was in my first year of graduate school, I uh, encountered an experience where it wasn't what I expected it to be. It, it was a lot of, um, I was hoping for more conversations around the meaning of quantum physics and what it really implies to our lives and, and uh, the deeper philosophy behind it all. But what I got was just, it's the math, it's the derivations. Don't ask too many questions about philosophy. Um, don't ask about, you know, this kind of consciousness thing. Like, don't go there. Just, just take your test, you know, do your study, pass your homework, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and focus on the rigor. And so I was immersed in 80 hours a week of just left brain science. Uh, whereas prior to that, I had a life of a lot of balance and diversity. And after a year of being 80 hours a week of just left brain science, I found myself really out of balance and depressed and really dissatisfied with what my experience was amounting to be. And I knew that something had to give. So, so something had to shift. So that that moment propelled me into the next year where I really started to search like a scientist would. What was the key to restoring balance? So I brought everything I had back into my life that I had previously. So I brought sports back in. I brought creative hobbies in. I brought more social time back in. And um, I, another year goes by. And, and so I've systematically brought all these aspects of life back in that should create a well-rounded lifestyle. And after another year, I'm like, okay, well, I feel more balanced, but something's still missing. I'm still not happy. What's that key to my joy and my sense of purpose and, and uh, meaning in life? And then there was this, this one day where this little voice kind of softly came in in the back of my mind and said, well, there's one thing I hadn't yet brought back in. And that one thing was spirituality. Uh, for me, spirituality had always just sort of been there on the side, just informing my outlook on life. Um, but I never thought it was that important. Uh, I didn't think it was so primary, but here it was. It was the only thing I hadn't brought back in. So then that was what propelled me into pursuing uh, the spiritual aspect and making it more of a priority. And uh, But at that point in time, I had to, anything I was going to pursue spiritually had to 
not negate what I knew to be true scientifically. So at least complement or, you know, find a way where the two complement each other. So, so that's where I started to explore science and spirituality, science and consciousness, um, which ultimately then synchronicity started stepping in to lead me on the path to finding the, the right spiritual, you know, I, I found that as, as much as I would explore in, a, in some spiritual uh, avenue or another, I would always hit a plateau or a wall, or that was as far as it could go for me. And, um, and, and I, it would get frustrating. You know, I had a lot of questions and I wanted the deeper insights. And so at, at some point, I really put it out there to the universe. I want to find my, my spiritual path and the community of people who are really going to connect at a, at a similar wavelength and, and get this and want to explore those deeper questions. And that then led me into um, the Western mystery tradition and hermetics and alchemy and Kabbalah and uh, the mystery school. So it's been an amazing journey ever since uh, because I've never, I've never hit the wall with the mystery school teachings. I've, I've always just continued to, to grow and deepen in, in knowledge, self-awareness and, uh, and my own personal progression through it. So it's been an amazing journey. What a beautiful, beautiful journey. Thank you so much for sharing. Has it ever occurred to you in the process that science and spirituality are really one and the same, mm. in essence? You know, I, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of people assume that they're separate, right? That they don't mix. And, um, you know, people often go like, how did a scientist get into spirituality? You, you know, you think they're opposite ends of the spectrum. But I think that that mindset is only out there because of both uh, religious uh, programming and in, within the scientific community, they went in the opposite direction. But originally, where science comes from is the tradition of alchemy. And in alchemy, alchemy was science and spirituality were intimately connected. You couldn't separate them. Absolutely. And I think that science has separated out from trying to say anything about the mind or the spirit because of religious persecution. And so, you know, Galileo's story is a really good example. He, you know, he put the model of the sun uh, being the center of, of the solar system instead of the earth. And then he got put on house arrest and called a heretic for the rest of his life. So, um, so because of that, they wanted the freedom to be able to explore science. And, and so scientists sort of gradually went away from having anything to say about the spiritual realm. But in that separation, I think some alchemy happened through that, that they were able to really advance science. But now we've gotten to this place where science has gone so far, but it's lacking the, the greater wisdom and, and moral guidance that comes from spirituality. And I think we're at this point in our evolution where we need to bring them back together, uh, which is another step in the alchemical process is, is uh, separate and recombine. So I, I have found the more that I've explored, the more I think science um, and spirituality complement each other. They, uh, but it, not from a dogmatic religious perspective. You know, you have to have that freedom to to explore and to know and to have understanding and to question assumptions and so forth, which science does. And um, and yet, science today has become its own dogma, where it's you know it's uh, too materialist driven, and it needs to open up its mind again to something beyond just the physical. Absolutely. And I feel that with this work, with merging or blending science and spirituality, looking at the history that you have just recounted, it has come a full circle, but not just a circle on the same plane. I see it as a vortex. So we, we've come the full circle, but we, at the same time, we are moving upwards in the level of understanding. So, so it's not stagnant on the same plane. It actually moves upwards. Beautiful. So this is a lovely segue 
to my next point. I titled this episode, The Alchemy of Life. (laughs) So let's take this as the starting point, as I said, and unpack as we go along. And both you and I, and I'm sure many, many more people call it or would call it the new paradigm of living, which is personal empowerment and expansion of our consciousness and awareness of who we are and what life is all about, which is what anyone would say, well, this is actually important to me because if I don't really have a good understanding of who I am and why I'm here and what this is all about, there is something missing in my fulfillment and in the fulfillment of my role in the grand scheme of things. So, Why is it important to bridge science and spirituality to find solutions in today's challenging world? And how would you describe the alchemy of life from your perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot to uh, unpack out of that. So they're wonderful questions. And I think what you said that, you know, this discovery of who am I, what is my place within the, the greater pick the bigger picture, the greater scheme of things. What's my place in the universe? What's my role? What is what is it that I'm here to fulfill in this life? Those, those were the same questions that set me on my journey and, and have really driven me through so many stages of that journey. And that journey is an alchemical journey. It is the, the alchemy of life, as you're saying. And, and our search for answers to those questions really is... Um, what will bring that fulfillment. Uh, It'll also, you know, it is a journey. So it's not like you have just one answer that you're seeking uh, to to any of those questions, like who am I, what's my purpose and my, my role within the greater universe. Like those all have multiple answers. And so we're always asking ourselves those questions. And, and as much as we evolve through our journey of life and, and through the transformational process, you, you know, just like you mentioned before, the spiraling up, like we, we, we spiral up and we then stand on a new foundation in our life um, that's at a higher level than it was before. But now we look from this new place, where can I go from here? And we ask the questions again. Yeah. So standing where I'm at now, what, who am I? What is my purpose? What is the role that I can fulfill in the universe? And so it's an ongoing process. And and it's that search and those asking of those questions. And where science and spirituality come into this, I feel, is that they provide us two um, two different lenses, uh, like like having two eyes. You know, you you we are bifocal in the sense that we have uh, one perception coming through one eye and another perception coming through a different eye. And between the two of them, they give us they give us depth perception. Yeah. They converge. They converge, but they give us much more information and many more like the ability to peer into the depth of things. I love this metaphor. Love it. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so science and spirituality are these two lenses through which we can look at at our, you know, how we find the answers to some of these biggest questions in life. Um, and the science brings a very grounded, practical evidence base, um, really trying to understand the depths of how things work. Uh, whereas spirituality brings, you know, more the the esoteric and the the mystical and, and goes beyond maybe what, you know, goes beyond the physical. So it goes beyond what science alone can say um, as we peer, you know, into the realms of of the spirit and the consciousness and the mind and and you know, pure awareness and what is the meaning of all that and where do we really come from beyond this physical experience. And I don't think you can get a complete answer with only looking at things from a a physical level or only looking at things from a spiritual level. We need both in order to give us that whole picture uh, and and to see into the the greater scope of, um, you know, what life is all about. Yes, and yeah, I love this metaphor. And you can, for argument's sake, to continue on your metaphor, you can live with just one eye, right or left, but your vision is incomplete. Yeah. Your view of the world is incomplete. And as you have beautifully put it, it is lacking the depth. 
mm-hmm. which only two eyes can give you or two two points of two perspectives can give you. Beautiful. So let's start going into some rabbit holes, which is my specialty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> can we create our reality with our thoughts, intention, and emotion working with the quantum field? And if so, how do karma and destiny fit into this model? So, um, yes, yes, and let's just say that, um, you know, in the hermetic teachings, in the ancient hermetic teachings, they say that all is mind, all is mind. And, and, and um, here we're talking the mind of source, like a divine source of some kind. And that all of creation is ultimately a thought within that mind of the all. And, and so everything starts within that, that greater mind. Um, and we are, um, we have connection to that. So, but you can think of us as like, let's, you know, if you imagine, for example, um, radio towers, right? And the kind of the older version of how we used to communicate. And, and the, in the old days, the radio signals would go out and they'd be in that certain frequency ranges. And there'd be this field of these radio frequencies, you know, out broadcasting the signals. And then in order to receive um, the radio, you had to have a, a, a receiver and an antenna and you could receive that and then trans, you know, transcribe that through a radio um, and you could listen to whatever station you wanted to listen to based on the, the channel or the frequency that you tuned into. So our individual soul and our brain are kind of like the antenna and the, uh, the receiver of these frequencies uh, of, of the thoughts from the greater mind. And that greater mind, we could say, is mind of God, mind of source, but it's also the collective mind of humanity because we we have a collective, we have a, a field of um, consciousness that we're all connected into as the human race. And so we're influenced by both, of, you know, all of these different frequencies and, you know, broadcastings that are happening at different levels within these, these collect, the collective mind and the mind of the all. And our ability to tune in is going to be based on our individual efforts to clear our mind, to quiet out the static, to really get good at dialing into the right station or the right frequency. And so can we create through thought um, and intention? Yes. But the question is, how clear is your signal being sent out? Um, How coherent is it? Do you have a lot of static going on? You know, you might be thinking and intending something at one level, at a conscious level, but subconsciously, maybe you're doubting it, or maybe you're thinking, I'm not actually worthy of that, even though I want that thing. And so sometimes we send out mixed signals out into, uh, you know, the field (laughs) and, and then we get mixed results back, you know, because of that. And this is why things like the secret haven't really always worked so well, you know, the, the law of attraction and so forth. Where is my new bike? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> and so then there's the question of what level of you is this desire coming from? Is it coming from your negative ego? Is it coming from your higher self? Is it coming from, you know, a higher divine plane? You know, so we need to really come to know ourselves and uh, so that we can figure out what part of us is sending out this desire. And we need to really learn to harness ourselves so that we can quiet our mind, so that we can really be more effective at tapping in to the quantum field and giving it a coherent signal, giving a coherent message, and also being able to receive uh, clearly, more clearly from that divine mind versus all this monkey mind and static and noise that goes on within our, you know, subconscious and conscious minds. So, so yes. Um and then there's work mm. to do to get effective at it. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. And then you you asked about uh, karma. So I, I want to give you a moment. Karma, karma and destiny. Yeah. So how does it fit into this model? Mm. So I look at karma as cause and effect, um, meaning I think that karma comes from actions taken 
but also thoughts. There are there are because thoughts can will manifest somewhere. May not always manifest through us, but it will manifest somewhere through the collective because we all share a collective mind. Um, so thoughts will lead to actions. Thoughts will manifest somewhere, and so both through our thoughts, our words, because our words will affect. Um, you know, they in the ancient tradition they say all magic is spoken. So words actually affect, and we know from the science of cymatics how sound and and words yeah. and so forth impact matter. Um, so through our thoughts, through our words, and through our actions or our deeds, these put out energy and they set things in motion that then has, you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. There's a response. There's an effect that comes from that, the cause and the effect. So the cause can be our thoughts, our words, or our deeds. Um, and even our deeds, you know, and our words usually come from thoughts from the beginning. Uh, but then the effect is the karmic response. And so, you know, are we putting out, and karma can be positive karma or it can be negative karma. Usually what we might call positive karma more like grace, um, whereas negative karma is like what a lot, a lot of times people think of as karma. So, so through our, our thoughts, our words, our deeds, we put out these energies that then manifest and, you know, they have an effect of some kind. And then that effect comes back around at some point uh, so that we can learn from our choices so that we can learn. Was that a good action? Was it not a good action? Were that, was that, did I say that right? Did I not say that right? Um, do I need to change my thinking at a fundamental level, yeah. you know, and, and what am I attracting based on what I'm thinking, you know, and, so, so that would be how I would say karma fits in uh, to this. And then when it comes to destiny, I look at destiny as, um, you know, bef long before we came into this physical life as a spirit, we had uh, a, a purpose. We had a purpose that we wanted to fulfill. And that purpose um, we set as our you know, it's kind of like a contract. It goes into our blueprints. Uh, our blueprints are within our DNA. And so we, you know, come into this life with a certain blueprint. Now, even though we have a blueprint and a destiny or a purpose that we're here to fulfill, we still have choices to make. And we can choose to align and, and take the actions that actually lead us towards the fulfillment to that purpose. Or we can, you know, get misled or kind of led astray and um, or make choices that that go off course and then we get out of alignment with our purpose and when we're out of alignment with our purpose we're usually very unhappy mm. um we feel uh, like like things aren't flowing well or we feel a lack of fulfillment inside or we feel a lack of joy but when we're aligned with our purpose when we're doing things that really are according to our blueprint it will feel fulfilling. It will feel meaningful. It will feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. And there's a certain sense of inner peace uh, that comes with that. And, um, and that you know that you're in the right place, but you, you also feel very driven to you know, create and driven to serve and driven to bring your gifts to the world. Uh, in a way that really benefits other people as well. And, and that, you know, our purpose is always going to have some kind of service involved, you know, service to others and stuff. So um, when we're not in alignment with our purpose, our karma is we feel kind of miserable about it. You know, we wonder what's going on and where should I be and why isn't life better than it is? And yeah, so... Mm. Oh, beautifully, beautifully said. Thank you. And I absolutely agree with you. I'm completely on the same page. I would like to uh, come back to karma because it is such a um, vexed topic. <laughs> Everyone has an opinion on, on what it is. I think that most people would relate to and would understand the karma that we create 
as you have described and with our thoughts, words and action as we go through life. And a lot of people, I think, are also well familiar with so-called instant karma. So we do something really, really positive, good, and then boom, something wonderful happens in our life. It comes to us, you know, could be five minutes later or an hour later, the same day. And likewise with negative karma. So there's, there is this concept of instant karma. And most people are fairly comfortable with this time frame. Now, what about karma based on those same principles? going across or being carried over from one lifetime to another on the tail of our destiny. And the key um, challenge here is that if I have created a bad karma, say, in this lifetime, I can trace it back and I can learn the lesson. I can understand, okay, I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have done that. That's easy or relatively easy or simple, I should say. The challenge comes in when we feel or we can identify via various, you know, various esoteric methods and psychic methods that what we are experiencing is a karma from our past lives, which we have agreed to bring into this lifetime to clear. But not having the memory of how did I create this, that's a really, really huge challenge. And many people are not even capable of completing this challenge and clearing this karma. So I would be curious to, to ask you, what, what, is your, what is your modern view? What is your suggestion? What is your advice to people? How to deal with negative karma that we feel or have identified we have carried over from another lifetime. What is your advice to people on that? Mm. Well, it, I, I think it's a, a bit of a, a deep dive conversation. Um, so in the mystery school that I study with, which is called the Modern Mystery School, and I'm a teacher for and so forth. So in the mystery school tradition, we actually have a different model for how to understand these things. And this is something that we teach in our uh, Empower Thyself uh, first step of initiation training, which is a full two day training. You know, so it's, it's much more it's much more in depth than what we can get involved in here in, in an hour long podcast conversation. Um, but it's a very important question. So there's different models out there. You know, you have the, the the Christian model, for example, where it's you have one life and you either do it perfect or you go to hell, you know, or you go to heaven and, and that's it. You have your materialist model where there's just this life and then you die and that's it, you know, and, and it is what it is. And then there's um, the reincarnation model where we uh, repeat the cycle over and over and over again until we break out of that karmic loop. And, uh, you know, you're, you're either uh, rewarded in the next life or you're punished in the next life based on how you, you know, take certain actions uh, in this life. But there are also other models out there. So, so these models that I've just mentioned, they're fairly simple in their ability for people to just sort of wrap their heads around. Um, but I, it, my understanding in the mystery teachings is that we're not so simple. <laughs> we are complex beings. We're multidimensional beings. We're eternal beings. We're on a journey as, as an eternal being. We're on a journey through eternity. And we've been through eons and eons and eons of, of experiences and evolution and, you know, whatnot, even before coming to this earth plane. Uh, and so we've, we've been on a journey through eternity and we've been visiting different um, planets even and star systems and dimensions and so forth before we ever come to earth. And so we're, we have galactic, you know, experiences. And I, I find that with the reincarnation model, often people get so caught up in all of it is about this experience here on earth. And then until we can get it perfect in this life, and yet we're going to often forget about what we experienced in the past, you know, it, it, it's like you're, um, it's kind of like saying, okay, you're, you know, you're going to flunk grade school over and over and over again until you do it absolutely perfect, until you learn how to build perfect sandcastles and you don't have anything, you know, wrong. 
and you get along with every single child in the play box, no matter how bad they act. And, you know, and then you're going to flunk it and mm. have to start all over again and forget what you <laughs> learned before so that you can then try from scratch again to get it perfect. And that, that model I, it doesn't work yeah. for me. As a scientist, it doesn't work for me. As a metaphysician, it doesn't work for me. But past lives, we can talk about past lives from a different perspective. Um, And the idea of karma, you know, that has carried over from the past into the present, we can talk about it from multiple perspectives. Uh, One perspective, for example, is ancestral karma. Our ancestors made choices and those choices affected their epigenetic expression of their DNA. And that we know scientifically that those choices and the memories contained, like uh, for example, there've been studies in epigenetics where uh, the uh, first generation of mice were, you know, had to learn how to run a maze in order to find the cheese. And once they learned to run the maze, they, they bred that generation uh, after generation, after generation. And they would then expose, you know, and put the mice, the later generations in the maze. And they found that the later generations knew how to run the maze and find their way to the cheese a lot faster. So they had a memory from the parents of, of how to find the reward, so to speak. And they saw that up to 14 generations later, the mice still maintained this memory. So we know from science, for example, that ancestral memories are passed down through the epigenetic uh, switches within our DNA that turn certain uh, traits and characteristics on or turn them off and so forth. Uh, So sometimes what people might remember as a past life could be a memory from an ancestor. And karmically speaking, there are, uh, you know, we also know from epigenetics that if, if an ancestor chose to become, you know, to take up the, the, the drink, drinking alcohol and they become an alcoholic, that changes things within their DNA, which then can also affect their uh, descendants. And then later descendants might have a predisposition to alcoholism or any kind of addiction. And, and yet that later descendant still has their personal choice as to whether they get into, you know, drinking or not. Um, and if they do choose, then it's like that, that predisposition gene gets triggered very quickly within them and then it becomes addictive. But it was, in a way, it was karmically ingrained in their DNA from that ancestral pattern of addiction. And yet we also, in this generation, we're not slaves to that. We have choice to still say, no, I'm going to, I'm not going to become, you know, dependent upon substances. I'm, I, or I'm going to get sober and I'm going to beat this in and shift that uh, within my own DNA for future generations. Same thing with our attitudes, our programming, you know, our, our, our mindset, all of these things affect our DNA. And like some of the work of, of Dr. Bruce Lipton, for example, and Dawson Church, like they really, they really have have demonstrated that. Um, so, so sometimes, you know, that that karma from the past is actually ancestral karma. Uh, so we can call it karma, we can call it epigenetic, whatever. You know, it's it's kind of the same. And and we are at generations alive today. I think are dealing with a lot of the karmic burden from our ancestors from the from the past of humanity and it's like all that karma from humanity is like coming up and it's being played out on so many fields and in so many different ways in today's world and you look at some of the the themes and the chaos that's happening in 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 you know various societies in the world today and it's playing out the same karmic patterns that we have in the past um and so that's one way that I think is scientifically backed that we could look at that. And then there's, um, then there's the, the concept of past life and memories where our, our soul is remembering something that we experienced where it seems like it wasn't necessarily ancestral, but it seems like, you know, maybe I had a memory of something over in Japan or I had a memory of, you know, something Native American or memory of an Atlantean or something along these lines. And I actually call it the soul DNA. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's, so the soul is remembering things, but um, in, in our 
teachings in the mystery school, the soul and the spirit are actually different. There's two different, there's three different vehicles that we work with. We work with the spirit, we work with the soul, and we work with the physical body. So we have this sort of triune self. And the spirit we call our eternal self. That is the part that is pure conscious, um, pure awareness, energy, uh, our, our true intuition, intelligence, individual, all of that comes from the spirit. The soul is actually more of like a software. It's an interface between the spirit and the body because the spirit and the body are at complete opposite ends of the vibrational spectrum. And they need a mediator, an interface between them so that the spirit, kind of like a computer system, you know, you have the user, you have the computer, the hardware, and then you have the operating system and all the software and the application files that allows the user to perform different functions with the hardware. Um, and so the software is like the soul. The soul is this interface between the spiritual and the physical. And, and some of the mind functions through it, our emotions function through it, personality gets developed within the soul. But the soul is, is programmed. The soul is programmed both through our physical life experience and indoctrinations and so forth. It's also programmed from the spiritual level and some of the memories of the spirit coming in and influencing um, the soul. But the soul uh, doesn't always understand the context with which some of those informations coming in from the spirit it's like it's trying to understand it from the context of this physical experience. And it's not always necessarily that same context. So, so the soul misinterprets sometimes what information is coming in from spirit. And then it tries to make meaning out of it within the framework that it understands, which is the physical. And so then it might take uh, an experience that our spirit had in its journey through eternity, which might not have been our physical life, but we, it was an experience nonetheless. We could have been an angel, for example, or a spirit guide, or you know, we could have been observing somebody else in the physical and 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 yet had that and had that memory of that and the learning of it and maybe some remorse that 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 it didn't go better or you know these kinds of things and that gets translated into the soul, but the soul doesn't have the right programming to put it in the right context. So then it misinterprets that experience. And that then, that however that soul interprets that then becomes the way that we feel like it's karma from a past life. Because we might feel like I had something I had to learn there, or I have a remorse because of, or I have a a trauma from, you know, witnessing somebody's, um, you know, persecution, for example. And, and, and I can't distinguish within my soul that maybe that wasn't my life that, but I observed it, you know? And, and so, so, so sometimes we get attached and we get personal about it. So you, I, I think that, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to, sh you know, go into the full details because that's something that, you know, is a long conversation. A very deep rabbit hole. <laughs> it's deep. Yeah, it's deep. Yeah. But I, I want to just give you a sense that there are nuances um, in, in the totality of our being. We are very multidimensional. And I want people to really recognize that this physical life is not the only place that we learn. Yeah. This physical world, this world of earth is not the only place we learn. There are many, many more places that we have learned before and that we will learn after this life. And this life, you know, when we're here on earth, in terms of the, the totality of our spirit's journey, this is the blink of an eye. This is a pit stop on a journey through eternity. And we're here to enjoy it. We're here to learn from it. But don't get so caught up in thinking that this is it. You know, when it comes to karma, yeah, we have karma, but this isn't the only place to remedy our karma either. There are many other levels. There's a much more benevolent system within the universe where there are many other levels where we can also come to greater levels of um, awareness and consciousness and um, and recognition of, oh, I I really screwed up there. Um and, and it's not that I always have to go and, and therefore I flunk and I have to go back and do it over and over and over again until I get it perfect while meanwhile forgetting <laughs> what, I've, what actually happened before. There's many more levels through which we can remedy our karma after this life um, because who we are is the spirit. We're not the body and we're not the soul, we're the spirit. 
So yeah, I just would encourage people to to have open open up the the, the field of possibilities. There are many models. There are many more um, nuanced op- options that uh, maybe take more investigation uh, versus just deciding, you know, it's this or it's that. Very, very good point. Thank you. And uh, that's for the first time that I've heard a view or a concept or a possibility that our soul is not necessarily all-knowing and all-understanding and that it can get confused. In my understanding, we have a soul, which I often call an over-soul, which is still one level if you like, below the spirit, the all that is. So there's the spirit, and then there is an oversoul, and that oversoul produces or divides itself into soul fragments, which are individualized souls that are connected with a particular body and develop a particular personality. So perhaps what you are talking about, I might understand as pertaining to that soul fragment, meaning that individualized soul that, if you like, manages or <laughs> or drives our body and, and, and develops personality, as opposed to that broader over soul, which may have many, you know, countless fragments. Are we going a bit too deep here now? <laughs> Maybe. No, that's fine. So um, uh, we... I think it's terminology. So definitions and terminology might be mm-hmm. getting a little um, confused here. So again, like how I would define a soul, what you're defining as an oversoul, we would actually define as part of spirit. Um, so the spirit is the all-knowing part. And, uh, and then the spirit groups itself. And so these groups that you, you know, you're, you mentioning oversoul, I would actually, in the mystery teachings, we would maybe define that as a monad uh, or a bodhisattva. And, um, and so there's a group of spirits that are part of that monad or that bodhisattva. And then those can, indiv- you know, many, many group, you know, individuate out from that group. And then they become like a higher self that then interfaces directly at an individual level into this physical life. And then that physical body has a soul, an individual soul that allows for that, you know, that higher self and that spirit to directly interface with the body. So I'm defining soul in a different way, I think, than, than what you are with, with the oversoul concept. But yeah, through, through you know, what, what we would call a monad, when somebody achieves a high enough level of expanding their awareness of themselves, they can also tap into the memories of that group self, that monad or that higher, higher, higher self. It's like the grandparents of the higher self. You know, it's like you have a family tree, like you have a family tree in the physical, you also have a family tree in the spiritual. And the more that we evolve, uh, the more we can actually tap in to the, the memories and the greater purpose of that family that's spiritual family so to speak and um and 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 it can we can remember it as if it was us as well so there's multiple ways in which we can have these memories of what you might call past lives but it doesn't necessarily have to fit only within a reincarnation model absolutely and the reason by the way i asked that question is uh, not you know as an interesting conversation topic but um, I always like to bring both scientific and esoteric concepts down to the practical level because, you know, it's lovely to have an academic or scientific conversation mm. or even spiritual conversation about it. But at the end of the day, we say, okay, so what's in it for me? Okay. Why would I want to be interested? Why even I would want to, to talk about it? Right. <laughs> so my point of curiosity in that question was in relation to karma we have created in this lifetime, which we can remember and we can correct relatively easily versus 
something that we know or, or it came up, say, in the past life regression or via other esoteric practices that that uh, it started, you know, centuries, thousands of years ago, whatever, which we don't have the memory of. So my question again is to take it down to the practical level, what could we do if we have this understanding? Okay, so I stuffed something up 500 years ago, but I have no clue what it was. All I know that that I'm now suffering and, and I've been told that there was something or other happened 500 years ago. So at the practical level, what can we do with this? Mm-hmm. That's a good question. Because that ultimately is is what's most important is the healing. Um, mm. So let's say, for Thank example, you. the healing. Yeah, yeah the healing. It, yeah. You know, I think it's so important, no matter what system of philosophy you believe, it's so important to let go of the story. So it actually doesn't matter what happened back then. It does. It really doesn't, um, because you know the more that we just get into the story uh, and rehash the story, and you know the the ego gets really attached to those identities and the victimhood of what happened to me, whether it was in this life or a past life or whatever. You know, we, or or you know maybe it's not the victim, but maybe it was like, oh well, I already you know I already was some high priestess in a past life, therefore I don't really need to do that now because I've already done it. You know, and and they get really like ego gets really self-inflated around the story. And so we want to move beyond the ego. Like the ego is our, is, is the negative ego in particular is the thing that stops us. The thing that makes us miserable (laughs) is the attachments held by the ego uh, within, you know, the, the, the subconscious and, and traumas in the body and in the soul and all of it. And so we want to heal so ultimately, it really doesn't matter what the story was because um, the the pattern of energy that needs healing comes up in every everything. You know, it's it's like how you do anything is how you do everything, and that same pattern, those same emotions, the same feelings, um, the same thought patterns, they'll come up again and again and again because that is in your subconscious program. Um, that is the framework upon which you you perceive everything in your life. And when you're pushed, when you're stressed, when you're under pressure, that's when those patterns tend to come up the most. But yet it's when we're stressed, pushed and under pressure that we need to perform our best, right? Because we want to keep our cool. But w- when we have these these patterns that are unresolved and unhealed, then they can kind of derail us in those moments when we really need to be actually performing our best. So you don't really need to get into the story and the memory of what happened. It's really more about, okay, I have this pattern. uh, I get angry or I get depressed or I get, you know, I get into self doubt or I feel unworthy or whatever that is, just, you can identify it now. And in a quantum perspective, there is only now, there is no past, there is no future. There's only now and all time is now. And so if I can get to the clarity of what it is here and now, let go of the story and let me just let me just bring the light and the, the energy of healing and transformation into this pattern that I have that comes up again and again. That's what I need to heal. And when it comes to healing, there's a couple things to, to a couple of keys, let's say, that really are at the core of it. Number one, all healing is self-healing. So we are responsible for our own healing. You can go to a healer or a therapist or a practitioner and they can help you. They can facilitate, they can hold space, they can help guide, but ultimately you have to be the one to choose to heal yourself. And you have to make the choices to let go of the attachments, to let go of the story, to let go of the victimhood, to to forgive, right? So that's the other key to healing is all healing starts with forgiveness. And, you know, forgiveness doesn't mean that you're condoning what happened. Forgiveness means you're letting go of the burden and you're you're, you're not giving your power away to what happened anymore. You're saying, okay, that happened. It is what it is. And what lessons can I take from it, right? How can I use that wounding as a leverage point for my transformation? You know, it becomes a catalyst that causes us to seek healing and improvements in our lives. And so if that thing that was a wound 
became the catalyst for your journey of transformation and healing, it served its purpose. It served, or or maybe it wasn't purposeful in the sense that it was meant to happen, but it, it just happened. But you gave it meaning in your life by deciding that you were going to use it to, to seek healing afterwards, right? And that journey of healing and transformation is we're all here for that in one way or another. We're all here to learn from this life. We're all here to, to grow and to transform and evolve to a better form of ourselves. And, and, and healing is a part of that. And so what we need to, like, why is any of this important? Well, it's, it's only important to the degree that you're really seeking the healing in your here and now. And so looking at your life now, what would you like to improve? You know, or, or if you look at the stressful times in your life, where, wh- where do you tend to go? Like what emotion comes up? And identifying those without necessarily having to process the why, the what, the when, the where, you know, the, the story of it all, just this is, this is the energy I have to heal. This is the wound, you know, and this is the, the button. And, and if I can get into that and heal the core of it and let go of all the story around it, because the ego likes to attach, you know, the identity that it forms likes to attach to the story, but that only entrenches the story more that the more we rehash the story, the more we actually re-traumatize ourselves because your mind can't tell the difference between what's imagined and what's actually lived. And so we, we want to let go of that story and actually get into the healing. And that's where the alchemy, uh, you know, the journey of transformation, the tools that we use, meditations, rituals, prayers, you know, various exercises that we can do that bring the energy in and, uh, or, you know, going and receiving a healing session that bring the energy in and help us transform and transmute the wounding rather than processing it through our mind. Uh, So there's a really big difference uh, in, in how we really heal within the mystery school. Thank you. And that's a very elegant explanation and guidance. I'm loving it. Thank you. Very, very elegant. And I think that people listening to this podcast will want to actually listen to this part at least a few times because there is some really profound, deep wisdom there. So beautiful. Okay. Before I ask you to uh, talk about more about your courses, programs, offerings, uh, your your TV program, etc., I would like to ask one more question and go into a even big rabbit hole, <laughs> which it is it is quite curious. And this is the biggest paradox of life, in my view. While there are various universal laws and spiritual laws and esoteric laws and principles, schools of wisdom, many different teachings, ancient wisdom, scientists, uh, scientific knowledge, cosmology, you name it. When we talk about karma, free will and destiny, and many other concepts, presumably governing our life experience, to me, the biggest paradox of life which rapidly emerges in my own life experience, at least, is that there is only one rule, which is there are no rules. And you touched upon this, in fact, a few moments ago. I had so many unexplainable experiences. I could write a book about it, and perhaps one day I will, (laughs) which contradict one another's law or rule. So effectively, what is, is what we want to be. So for example, if you believe that you can manifest things only in a deep meditation, that's your experience. When you then change your belief and decide, oh no, in fact, I can manifest things just by, just by um, setting my intention and that's it. This, again, becomes your experience. And so it's often as if the universe was playing a game with me, activating certain rules and laws and then deactivating them and changing them, saying, well, figure this one out. (laughs) So my question is, do you agree or would you agree that we can create whatever rules and books of wisdoms and rituals 
and principles we want, making them simple or complex as we want, it doesn't matter at the end of the day because there is only just one rule. Whatever you believe is true, that's what it is until the universe decides to change it again. So there is one rule. There are no rules. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Um, I don't think I would put it that way personally. I I think that there maybe at the spiritual level, whatever's going on in our mind, whatever we believe, that is what's impressing itself upon the um, etheric field, the astral field, you know, the energetic planes, and then that that can manifest into our reality. But at the physical level, there are definitely laws. There are laws of nature. There are rules. And um, and at the spiritual level, there are there's the law of God. The law of God is maybe more simple, right? Love all, uh, do unto others as you to have them do unto yourself. You know, it's it's more simple. Free will, give people choice, do no harm. You know, there's simple rules. Um, and and so within, you know, beyond that, we have a lot of room for for experience and for choice. And because we have that choice we can create according to our choices and we can learn from our own mistakes and our own successes. And so, yeah, you, you can, you have a lot of leeway, let's say to explore, which might be why you have um, experienced this paradox in your life. But I think that all paradoxes may be reconciled at some point. Um, and, and it's just a matter of seeing things from a higher plane or a higher, pers- higher dimensional reality where we can see how it all, uh, those paradoxes seem contradictory, but now I see where they connect, but we have to be able to shift to a higher plane of awareness to recognize that. So I think the danger in saying, you know, there, there are no rules, do what you will, is that then it's saying, well, all that matters is my will and my belief and, there's nothing higher than me that uh, that that I would have to be accountable to at some point. And this this verges on uh, you know some some dangerous territory <laughs> because the ego can again take that in a direction that thinks that it's it's the ultimate God and that's all that matters. And so it's really important to always recognize that there is a higher source and there is a higher order. Uh, the universe works on order, not disorder. Um, yes, there is entropy and there is chaos out there, but the light and the life and progression happen through order, not through chaos. Chaos can lead to a lot of other things, but usually it it's ends in some kind of destruction or, or you know confusion. So we want order in our life. And there is, you know, when you really, from a, from a, the perspective of, of a scientist and as a metaphysician, when I look at um, the, the nature, when I look at myself, when I, my body, when I look at um, the, the universe out there, there's always order to be found. And order comes because it, it's according to certain laws or according to certain rules. And then I have choice as to whether I align with the that natural order, the 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 laws of nature and the laws of the divine, or whether I choose not to align with it, that is my choice, and then I will learn from my choices whether it produces good fruits or not. Um, and so I I you know you look at um, the, the human body for example, the human body. Uh, so in the ancient mystery teachings, they say if you want to know the universe, then you need to know thyself. And um, to know thyself, you know, we can look at the levels of mind, but it's easy, even easier to look at just the, the body itself because that is according to nature as well. And um, we have these nested structures. There's hierarchy within our body. You know, you have your cells, your cells build up to your tissues, tissues build up to different organs. Those organs govern different systems in the body. Those systems are all interrelated in some way. And only through the functioning of the whole, everything, all the systems functioning well, do we have health in the body and do we thrive? And this is the same thing out in nature. Um, Nature has, has hierarchies and nested hierarchies and interrelated systems all throughout 
and and out in the cosmos you see the same thing you know the the planets orbit the the sun and and so forth the stars and the the, the various solar systems orbit the galaxy and the you know there's order and structure there and yet there's also interconnected systems and so it's very dynamic it's very alive there's a lot of leeway within that um, but I do feel that it is important to come to learn what those laws of nature and the universe and, and the laws of the divine are so that we can then make better choices. Because when we align with those, things will flow better in our lives. When we don't align with those, things will become more diseased. And, and so, you know, that's your karma, <laughs> uh, if you want to come back to that. So, so I do think it's important to learn the laws. And, and this is one of the things that we study very deeply in the mystery teachings uh, and in the, in the mystery school tradition is, is really understanding the laws of nature, the laws of the universe, the laws of God, um, the laws of, of human, and really understanding what is aligned with the order and the flow of light and progression um, versus what gets out of alignment with that and causes disruption. Mm, beautiful, thank you. So we might say that there is order in chaos and there is a reason and explanation for every paradox. Yes, there is definitely. From the higher perspective. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. There okay. is order. There's order. Mm. And then there's chaos. And there are two different forces. There's, um, you know, there's the forces of entropy, which lead things towards disorder. And then there's also the forces of of leading things towards higher orders, higher order structures. And so there's these two forces out there and they, they sometimes work in opposition, but they also sometimes both are needed in, you know, creation and destruction. Destruction is a part of the cycle. And, you know, so they're, they're there and they serve a purpose, but they're not the same necessarily. And thank you. And this is what you just said has really resonated with me, that there is a type of chaos a designed to produce a higher level of order. If you're talking like mathematics, um, chaos theory, for example, there is something called strange attractors, uh, that even though the exact path that something might follow uh, is chaotic and you can't predict it, there are these strange attractors, there are these vortexes, so to speak, that happen, that that keep drawing things back in towards it, even though it might take a, a, a random path. And so from a mathematical un understanding of chaos, yes, there, there can be order that emerges from it. Um, but when, when we're talking like the laws of spirit, there is a very definite order that is according not to chaos, it's not just an emergent phenomenon out of the chaos, it is according to divine will. It is according to will and the thoughts from the mind of the all that that order comes to be. That is like the force of creation from, from the spirit. And it is applying its will, it is sending the light out to bring order into the chaos, to bring the light into the darkness versus you know, it emerging from the darkness is very different, right? So, so there's different ways of, of um, looking at this. Yeah, it, it gets complex. It's a very deep study <laughs> to really come to the fullness of appreciation of it. Absolutely. Very deep rabbit hole. <laughs> now, let's talk about your courses, your programs, your offerings, uh, the Quantum Minds TV, the Modern Mystery School. Of course, I will include all the links in the show notes so people can contact you and find out more information. But could you just give us a sense of your offerings and how people can engage with you? Yeah, so there's a number of offerings that I have. Um, and and that's so that, you know, no matter where people are in the world, they can, they can engage, right? So um, I would say that the deepest teachings that I give are going to be held within the work I do with the Modern Mystery School. 
the modern mystery school is not my school. It's a, it's an ancient lineage, ancient mystery school tradition uh, brought forward into modern times that in, and openly teaching um, these teachings, but those teachings happen in person. So they require an, an immersive experience into, you know, a physical environment with the, the teacher and other people uh, to go through the, the really hands-on direct transformational process that happens through the ancient mystery teachings. So that's where you get really the, the real work. We get into the meat of it. And, uh, you know, to, to really start that path, someone would need to receive something called a life activation from one of the uh, practitioners, certified practitioners from the Modern Mystery School. And we have, we have practitioners all over the world. Um, so they can go to modernmysteryschool.com and look, uh, you know, find a guide or practitioner under the connect and, and look for a life activation practitioner. Um, but those are done in person. So uh, then from there, after life activation, I would recommend people take uh, the empower thyself training um, and step into the, the, the path of the deeper teachings and, and initiation and, and learning the tools that you can really use to transform your life. And, and again, that's going to be something that's done in person. So I offer periodically, for example, a week long training called empower uh, empowerment week, and it gives the, all the foundational uh, tools and teachings of the mystery school in one week which then prepares somebody if they wanted to go on for higher levels of training, it would prepare them to take that next step uh, and, and step into the second level of initiation. Um, so that's something I offer personally, maybe three times a year, but we also have other guides uh, from the mystery school who offer this in various locations around the world. And again, they can find those, those lists on the mystery school website. And, and then there's the work that I do uh, where, you know, no matter where somebody is, if they want to engage with my work, there's some online options. Um, there's only so much that I can offer and teach online because really like the immersive experience is where the real transformation happens. But I have my mystery teaching series on Gaia, right? So if someone subscribes to Gaia TV, uh, they can access the mystery teachings along with lots of other things that are produced by Gaia. Uh, so I have four seasons of mystery teachings and, and they can find out about that by going to mysteryteachings.com. Um, there's my own uh, show that I'm currently hosting and, and producing uh, in-house that we've just made available for free. Uh, it's called Quantum Minds TV. And it's me uh, having deep conversations with other uh, experts that I have uh, selected to um, have conversations with. And we, um, we take a pretty deep dive into certain topics specifically around what is it going to take to create a shift in human consciousness? Like how, what do we really need to focus on? Because the world needs to shift right now and what's it going to take? And so all those conversations are, are centered around that. And it's showing through the various people that I uh, have these dialogues with, like, there is common themes and common messages that come and emerge out of that. Um, and these are all, pe all people. And that's free on your website. It's free. Yeah, it's free. At, at They can go to quantummindstv.com and, you know, just enter their uh, email and name. And mm -hmm. then they can get free access as soon as each one drops. Um, once they've already been released for a week or two, we also put them up on YouTube. So they can find me on YouTube, uh, Dr. Teresa Bullard. QLA, I think is the, the handle on YouTube. And then I have an online course called the Quantum Transformation Formula, where that's something that someone would have to purchase, but they can go through, uh, it's like 10 modules uh, that really lead them through uh, a process, a formula uh, that involves meditation and really working the process of manifestation, accessing higher creative states, accessing um, heightened states of consciousness, and, and new ideas and so forth. And then bringing that down through brainstorming and planning and putting a blueprint in place and then, you know, taking action and working with law of attraction, and, but many, many levels beyond that <laughs> with alchemy and quantum mindset and so forth. Um, so that's at quantumtransformationformula.com. And all of this is, is accessible through my website at teresabullard.com. Lovely. Thank you. And is this quantum uh, manifestation formula the first level, the first step for someone wanting to engage in, in with your teachings, like the basics, the first step, or is it something a bit more advanced? 
Um, I think it's not necessarily a first step. It might be like first step might be that they just start engaging with my content that's available free, um, like Quantum Minds TV, or I have a lot of videos on YouTube um, and I have a book, you know, it's called The Game Changers, Social Alchemists in the 21st Century. So these are more entry level. Uh, and then if they feel a resonance with my message, then, and they, they can't come for an in-person training, then I would recommend, you know, that there's a, a deeper sort of process, practical process that I guide people through with the quantum transformation formula. But it's very specific to the process of manifestation mm -hmm. and problem solving and, you know, learning to access a higher state of consciousness through a particular meditation technique. Um, but then it's, you know, I really guide people through a lot of practical steps in the manifestation process. Um, so it's a little bit of a, it's a middle step, I would say, but okay. it's just for the people who I made that for the people who really couldn't travel to come in person necessarily. And they needed, they wanted something that they could, you know, dig their teeth into without necessarily having to come in person, but it's not the same thing. Like they really want to dive into the work with, with me. It would be the in-person training that I offer through empowerment week. Um, and then my, and what about is it? Um, I, I offer it in different locations. So like I'm based in the UK now. So we have a center where we offer some training here. Uh, it's called the Quantum Learning Academy in West Yorkshire. Uh, and then I also travel uh, sometimes to the States and I might offer like a training there uh, once a year. I also uh, am a teacher with the Modern Mystery School. So they'll have me, uh, you know, teaching at different programs around the world uh, depending on where I'm most needed within the flow of, of those higher level teachings that we do. Um, so if somebody were to get initiated and then go on to higher levels of training with the mystery school, they would probably uh, at some point, you know, end up in a class with me, depending on what they decided to, to take. Do you have a center in Australia? Um, there, there is one uh, mystery school guide who has relocated back to Australia and uh, she, I believe, is near Tasmania. Okay. Um, and then there is one other practitioner uh, who's regularly in Sydney uh, doing life activations and so forth. So, so there, you know, we've had people in the past, but it's it's often had a hard time, like really anchoring. But I do feel very strongly that uh, this um, Cassandra Cooper, who's down into the Tasmania area is going to be able to really mm -hmm. bring the teachings. And she probably will travel at some point around Australia and offer mm -hmm. uh, empower thyself as well. Um, and then my husband and I have the, something called the quantum learning Academy, uh, which is um, different from the mystery school work. It's, it's more kind of mind body uh, and there's soul and spirit, but it's a fusion. Um, and that's going to be, coming out more. So we'll be producing more online training as well as in-person courses uh, for people that are, aren't quite sure they're ready to dive deep into the mystery uh, work, but they, they want the tools for improving their lives. So that's something else that we'll be mm. making available soon. Beautiful. Gosh, what a smorgasbord of, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of, of wonderful content. So there is something for everyone. Pretty much beautiful. Okay, my final question. If you were granted three wishes by a genie, anything you want, anything at all, mm. what would they be? Well, yeah. Take a moment if you like. You know, the biggest <laughs> thing that drives me in my life is, um, which would be a big wish, is, is to see this world become a more harmonious and sustainable and um, peaceful world. We call it Shambhala, uh, you know, much more enlightened way of life on earth. So that would be my big, my big wish. Mm -hmm. All three wishes might actually be taken up fulfilling that one um, <laughs> <laughs> at a, at, the other, yeah, another at two. a personal level. Um, you know, my life is really good, uh, I, but I could always, you know, wish for more, just more amplified flow that I could uh, bring into flow into the work that I do, you know, that we want to, for example, uh, bring more uh, scientific research into some of the various modalities that we work with. And that takes funding. And, you know, so having, having, and the right team in place to support that, you know, that 
the those are some of the big things that that I see for future projects that will take a, a big you know kind of okay so that's two something something beyond some kind of intervention one more um, <laughs> yeah and and then uh, my my other big project right now is is getting my new a new book done okay and it takes a lot of time and focus to uh to to write a full length uh, book but it's you know I've, I've been working on this my magnum opus you know my great work so to speak of of compiling all of my knowledge of the science and and the spiritual and trying to bring it together but in a way that's also easy enough for people to understand and, and read and and keep following without feeling like it's too complicated yeah. <laughs> so this is uh what i could use some some uh you know divine support Mag magic right powers <laughs> to help you lovely yes. yes okay dr theresa is there anything else that you would like to add i mean we've covered quite a lot of ground but at the same time we barely scratched the surface obviously is there anything in particular you would like to leave our audience with Yeah, you know, I think that there were a lot of gems uh, and and things discussed here in this conversation that people could listen to again and again and again uh, to to mm. really grasp. And and I I want people to just really know that they are they have so much more potential and so much more capacity within them than what they may even realize, uh, and certainly than what they're currently manifesting. And um, And it is our opportunity and our um, it the powers in our hands to do something about it, right? And it's our responsibility to to do something about it. It's not just going to happen to us. We have to apply ourselves to really awaken uh, those greater potentials and abilities within us, and to find that joy in our lives that's going to come from really living our true purpose. And um, the most important thing you could do in life is seek that, you know, to really apply yourself. And, and it's a journey. It's a long, it's a long journey, but it's a worthwhile journey. It's a rewarding journey. And, um, but it's not going to just happen to you. You have to go out in search of it and you have to really like seek and keep seeking until you find. And even when you find, there's new doors that open up to you. So embark on that journey because it's a grand adventure and it brings a lot of excitement to life and um, a lot more meaning and depth and richness to life. And, and that's you know what we're here for. We're here to really enjoy this experience and, and, and embrace all the forms of life and learn from them. And um, and fulfill our, our greater purpose and potential. So if, if there's anything I could really encourage people to do, it's don't settle for the mediocre. Don't settle for the mundane, like really go out in search of what is what will create an extraordinary life for you. And there's a lot of tools available, a lot of teachings, more than ever on the planet before. We've, we have so much accessible to us now um, that you should take advantage of it. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Teresa. It's been such a pleasure to have you on Quantum Living. And I, I do encourage again people to listen to this podcast a few times to gain the full advantage and benefit from this conversation. And obviously, if they feel so inclined to contact you and peruse your website and all the contents there. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure and joy to be speaking with you. Thank you. I enjoyed the conversation. So thank you. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well. <laughs>